Well, hello everybody, um, a very warm welcome. I'm uh, Judith Rees, the uh, di director of the school. And I'm, it's a real personal pleasure uh, for me to welcome you all here and, and a really warm welcome to the members of Lionel uh, Robbins' family who are with us today. Um, this is a lecture series, I'm sure that you know, a series of three lectures that is in, in memory of Lionel Robbins and also in honour of Lionel Robbins. Uh, Lionel was, of course, a, a big man, I think, in every sense of the word. And looking around, I'll see some faces who would know Lionel very much better than I did. I can remember being a student and being absolutely scared stiff of him at a time, I think, when students are scared rather more easily than they do today. Lionel, of course, had a very, very long, uh, long uh, linkage with the school. He was a student here in the early 1920s and actually became a uh, actually pre president of the Students' Union, which I uh, hadn't known. He then went on the staff and was on the staff for some 30 years. But during that time on the staff, he managed to find time to be head of the, of the economic section of the uh, cabinet during the war. And he did a whole range of other uh, elements of public service. Now, if you look down the list of people who have given this lecture, it reads like a veritable who's who of, you know, the big economic thinkers of our time. So, for me, it's a very great uh, pleasure to be able to see Nick Stern's uh, name uh, added to that list. Uh, as you will uh, know, until fairly recently, he was actually my boss uh, as chairman of the uh, Grantham Research Institute. It's quite nice to turn the uh, tails on him just for a few months anyway. Uh, but of course, Nick is a man of many parts. He is also the IG uh, Patel uh, chair here. He chairs the uh, Asia Research Institute. He has been advisor to so many people, and I'm really not going through uh, the whole list. And of course, uh, he is now stuck with uh, the sort of title of Lord, uh, Lord Climate, although uh, he tells me constantly that he does, does do other things. <laughs> so, uh, without uh, further ado, may I uh, ask Nick if you will give the, the first of, of his lectures in this three-part uh, part episode. Okay, let's put it that way. Um, thank you, boss. Um, the uh, first things to do is to make sure you can hear me in the back of the hall. Uh, the next thing is to tell you to turn off your mobile phones. And the one after that is to make sure that the slideshow works. Oh, that's reassuring. Now, thank you, Judith, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the leadership you've given to the LSC over these, uh, this last year and the months to come. Um, thank you to the um, Centre for Economic Performance that has been the main organiser, to the professors of economics who have to select the Lionel Robbins lectures, to my friend and colleague Richard Layard who's the sort of life force in LSE behind these lectures. Thank you so much to the Lionel Robbins family that's, uh, that's here today and uh, to the chairs of the lectures, not just Judith, but um, also Richard Layard and John Van Rienen, who will be chairing the others. 
So thank you all. It's a great honour and pleasure to give the Lionel Robbins lectures. Now, um, since the Stern Review was published, which I have to live with um, being associated with the Stern Review, um, but I insist that I'm a development economics interested in the development, development economist interested in the economics of policy and have been all my adult life and continue uh, with those interests and will keep them uh, relentlessly to the end, which is a long way away. And, uh, but it is five and a half years now since it was published, so there's a lot of reflection to do since then. A good number of the Stern Review are on the staff of the, who were on the staff of the LSE, sorry, who were on the staff of the L Review are now on the staff of the LSE, some of them here tonight, and it's a pleasure to, to be working with them. But five and a half years on, um, we can ask, well, what would you see differently? Well, I certainly would not see differently the central thesis, which is that the costs of uh, inaction are enormous and the costs of action are manageable, indeed would send us on a rather attractive path. That was the biggest conclusion of the Stern Review, and I think it applies still more strongly with uh, hindsight. But what I want to focus on today is not so much that statement, although we must never lose sight of it, but it's the um, details of the economics of policy that you need to bring the kind of action that we need about. That's the difficult stuff. Um, it's not just the economics of policy, it's the politics of policy and all kinds of other things as well. But that's where I want to uh, focus and focus the attention. But looking back, um, the uh, science looks still more worrying than it looked uh, five and a half years ago. Our emissions are at least 10% higher flow emissions year by year than they were five or six years ago. So that side is more worrying. What's, what's more encouraging is the quite extraordinary rapid technological change. And I will be referring um, fairly regularly, and it's a big part of what I want to say, to that um, technological change. I think the understanding of the economics of policy has deepened over those years. And I hope we contributed to that and continue to contribute to that. The understanding in politics is deeper than it used to be. Like climate change, there's a strong trend and lots of oscillations, and there's a strong trend upwards in the understanding of policy and the commitment, but there are lots of oscillations. The oscillations, particularly actually in the rich countries, in the developing world, the commitment gets stronger and stronger, and that's something I'll, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to. But nevertheless, notwithstanding that growing commitment, we are headed for pretty dangerous territory on the kind of path we're following, even taking into account the uh, Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban commitments, which are significant and important, but uh, we're still headed to very difficult territory. So we, nearly need, we really have to tighten up if we're to avoid the severe risks of climate change. And what I have to say is about uh, how we do that tightening up, how we pursue the policy. Now, in going about that story, we have to have a big picture. The big picture is one of the two defining challenges of our, our century, managing uh, climate change and overcoming poverty. If we fail on one, we fail on the other. And that is a key uh, aspect to this whole analysis that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. In doing the analysis, the big issues are risk and values. And how do we organize our economics to take into account the huge risks? And how do we think about the values that we have to bring if we're to be serious about this uh, analysis? Now, much of the necessary economics for this is already with us. Uh, indeed, I think a big part of it is already with us. Some of it, like the technologies that uh, are necessary, we're going to have to develop as we go along. And I want to say something about what those parts are and how we have to do it. But Lionel Robbins himself was very clear about the kinds of things which we had to use and the kind of methods which we have, which we have to bring to the table. He was very influenced by uh, Pigou and by Schumpeter, by Pigou on the theory of externalities and by Schumpeter on waves of technological change. And um, these are absolutely key, central, to the economics which we have to bring to bear. Now, I want to illustrate that by 
um, some quotes. These are the only quotes I'll give you from Lionel Robbins, but they're important. Now, the one that everybody knows is that economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between given ends and scarce means which have alternative usage. It's constantly quoted, but people think that Lionel Robbins thought that that's all there was to it. And they're absolutely dead wrong. He was a man who knew and understood about market failure, was interested in uh, technology, technological change, was interested in moral philosophy and income distribution. So the two other two quotes from Lionel Robbins, I've, um, which I've drawn attention to, underline that. The second quote on, uh, on the screen is clearly about the role of tax and expenditure policy in tackling income distribution. And I think that quote is a good guide now to the kinds of issues which uh, we have to think about if you're talking about um, uh, income distribution. It's clear it mattered greatly to him. So his definition of economics was not one that showed a lack of interest in income distribution. He was simply noting that you had to bring values to the table if you're going to uh, discuss income distribution. The second quote that I have here refers, he's talking about diseconomies, external diseconomies of consumption, and he draws attention to what Pigou had to say about that, um, and he's quite right. The Economics of Welfare is a truly great book, and uh, he, Pigou focused on external diseconomies of production, and uh, he's drawing attention to, well, they come in on consumption as well. So with his uh, relationships with Schumpeter and Hayek, which were about the process of discovery and waves of technological change, and his affinity to uh, good welfare economics, particularly associated with Pigou, Lionel Robbins actually brought a big part of the apparatus that you need to discuss climate change to the, um, to the table. And you've got to remember that LSC, he, he was a professor of economics here for at least 30 years and head of the department for much or all of that time. And he was a colleague of Hayek for 20 years. And he was a colleague of James Mead, the wonderful James Mead, for 10 years. And in fact, they overlapped Hayek and Mead for three years. And many of us would have paid anything to be at the lunch table with um, Lionel Robbins, um, Friedrich von Hayek, and James Mead. I mean, imagine what the conversation would have been like. Hayek and, of course, Mead, two of LSE's numerous Nobel Prize winners in uh, economics. But that's the background. I'm not going to go back to Lionel Robbins much during the course of the lectures, but I wanted to lay out very clearly at the beginning just how central to Lionel Robbins' concerns were the kind of policy uh, tools and techniques that were necessary for understanding this problem. Now, I've got loads of slides. You're not going to see them all, um, because the slides are a good part of the text that we have to put together for turning this into the book, which it uh, has to be. The slides will go up about 8 o'clock in the evening, in theory. Everything works well. Of course, LSE is administered like clockwork, so uh, no doubt they will go up exactly at uh, 8 o'clock. So each evening, You'll see the slides and you can go away and read them if that's your, where you like to spend your e evenings. Um, but uh, I don't want to put them all up. Um, they've been developed here with uh, my close colleague, um, James Ridge, who uh, helped me put all these things together. And I'm very grateful to you, James, for all that work. So um, what I'm going to do then is to just focus on some of the slides, but I'll tell the whole story if I can. If Judith gives me the time, I'll tell the story. Uh, this is the way I want to uh, break it up. The underlying science shapes all the big questions. It's the, the science throws at us questions about policy actually in about as difficult a way as it could possibly happen in terms of uh, economics. And it has to shape how we think about the ethics, it, about the economics, and indeed about the whole communication side of this, which I'll come back to in the last lecture. And I want to close this discussion with a quick sketch of what I alluded to earlier, just how difficult the path that we're already headed on looks like, taking into account 
the commitments that we've already made. Let me go very rapidly through the science. It goes back to the 1820s. Uh, Joseph Fourier uh, understood that something must be trapping the escape of the heat from um, the atmosphere because he worked out that the Earth was uh, warmer than a simple heat exchange analysis would give. The British scientist John Tyndall experimentally worked out which were the gases that were doing the trapping. Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist, started to look at the numbers of how big some of these effects might be. And by the early 19, sorry, by the 1930s and 40s, with uh, when quantum mechanics was brought into the story, it was uh, the physics of how this works was identified. Essentially, the um, Essentially, the vibrations of the greenhouse gas molecules interfere with the escape of the infrared, but not with the incoming ultraviolet, given the different frequencies of um, vibration. So this is uh, something that was built up uh, over the centuries, and it's really built up before the detailed data started to come in. So this is good theory. The theory appears before the data, and when the data start to come in in detail, they're strongly in support of the theory. This isn't a correlation looking for a theory, it's the other way around. It's a theory that turns out to be strongly supported by the evidence. How does all this work in relation to humans and effects on humans? Well, humans emit greenhouse gases through their production and consumption activities. It's not all absorbed by uh, the planet, so the stock from those flows of emissions, the stock and concentrations rise. That rise in concentrations leads to trapping and warming and climate change, and that impacts directly on the lives and livelihoods of people. So that's the chain of causation involving humans. So that's the basics of the science. I haven't got time to uh, dwell on it, um, but it drives the whole story. And what does it tell us? It tells us, because each of the steps I've just described, um, humans to flows, flows to stocks, stocks to climate change, climate change back to people, each of those steps involves a lot of uncertainty. Sometimes uncertainty prediction, sometimes inherent uncertainty in the processes themselves. So uncertainty is fundamental. The scale is enormous, as I'll uh, illustrate in a moment. The lags are long in many of these uh, processes, and the generation of the uh, flows of greenhouse gases is blind, or the effects are blind to where the greenhouse gas was emitted. It doesn't matter if you've got a kilogram of CO2 emitted in Johannesburg, or London, or New York, or Beijing, it has the same effect. It's public. It's a public good in the jargon of economics. Um, I'm a professor of economics, this is the Lionel Robbins lecture, so you're going to get some economics. And uh, those of you who are not economists, um, well, that's your fault. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, try, to, I'll, but I'll try not to make it heavy. And, uh, but those of you who are economists will recognize that underneath a lot of what I'm saying is some quite difficult economics, but I'll try not to be too much in your face on, on, uh, on all that. But you can see that this combination of scale risk, lags, and publicness, those four features which come directly from the science, make this a fiendishly difficult subject in terms of the economics, in terms of the ethics, and in terms of the communication, and in terms of getting political action. And those features coming from the science will come back all the time in the kinds of difficulties that uh, I'll raise along the way. But don't worry too much about the difficulties, because I do want to argue that we know pretty well what to do and uh, we know how to do it, the biggest challenge of all is getting the political will to make it <coughs> actually happen. So that's a very quick run through the science. What about the scale of the risks? Well, the numbers matter, so I'll give you a few numbers. We're now about 445 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, not just CO2, but equivalent in terms of warming effect, bringing in the other greenhouse gases as well. I'll just talk about what's conventional in this area, which is the Kyoto gases, the gases identified in the Kyoto Protocol. There's six of those, but CO2 is the main one. But I'll talk about CO2 equivalent. That isn't actually all the greenhouse gases, but that's where I'll um, focus. So we're now about 445 um, parts per million CO2 equivalent. That's the concentration, that's the stock 
We're adding about two and a half parts per million uh, a year. 70 years ago, we were adding half a part per million. We're now adding two and a half parts per million, and that's rising. So it's not just the concentrations that are rising here, the flows are rising, and rising very sharply. So that shows how big a problem we have uh, to deal with. If you ran that forward, adding two and a half parts per million and rising, if you ran that forward for 100 years, well, suppose it averaged at three, that's a conservative estimate, suppose at business as usual, it averaged three per year that you're adding over that 100 years, well, you'd be adding 300, 445 plus 300, ballpark 750. That would give us something like 30, 40, 50% chance of temperature increases over five degrees centigrade. We can't be precise about these things, but these are not small probabilities. As far as we can guess, as far as the science tells us, maybe 30, 40, 50 percent probabilities of if we stopped it right there, the concentrations at 750 are going above five degrees centigrade. We have not been there as a planet, five degrees centigrade, for about 30 million years. We haven't been at three degrees centigrade for about three million years. We've been around as humans for about 250,000 years. I think that's a pretty generous notion of sapiens in Homo sapiens, but about 250,000. But our civilizations are only eight, 9,000 years ago. They come from when we started to cultivate grass. Because when you cultivate grass, you stay in uh, one place, you're sedentary, because you plant, you wait, and you wait until you get your maize or corn or rice or whatever the grass has become. Uh, you also are able to uh, store more easily than you can store wheat, store, store meat. You can store wheat more easily than you can store meat. So there's reasons, and of course you can have a surplus. So you can go to university and paint paintings and write books and, and so on. So basically our civilization comes from that period since the last ice age eight, nine thousand years ago. It's very young. And in that time, it looks as if, now we can't be sure about this, it looks as if we've been about plus or minus one degree since uh, over that period. We can be quite confident, actually, about the last 2,000 years ago, and the, about the last 2,000 years, and the references are there. But we've been in, that, in a narrow range, probably around plus or minus one degree over that period. So we're already actually gone just a bit outside that range, outside the range of the experience of our civilization, and it's going up pretty rapidly. And of course, five degrees is way, way outside what we've experienced as human beings. We can't predict exactly what will happen. Probably southern Europe would look like the Sahara Desert. Um, before long, much of Bangladesh would be underwater, and Florida, and the, uh, the Nile Delta, and areas affecting hundreds of uh, millions, probably billions of people. Sea level rise takes a long time, but some of the other effects could come through much more quickly. Uh, things like the disruption of the North Indian monsoon. I've been working in one village in India for nearly 40 years now. It, like most of the Gindo Gangetic Plain, depends crucially on the rainfall and the flows off the Himalayas. If that changed, it would have a radical rewriting of where people live. Last week I was in Bihar at a conference with the Chief Minister. It was opened by the Prime Minister of Nepal. Bihar, 100 million people. It used to be 150, then they shifted 50 million off into Jharkhand. But Bihar is 100 million people, and it's enormously dependent by what happens and the runoff and the flows in Nepal. It's one of the most flood-prone areas in the world and it's one of the most densely populated areas in the world. This is an example of the kind of disruption that climate change could cause. Judith is one of the world's experts on water. She knows much more about this kind of thing than I do. But the potential for disruption of hundreds of millions of people is just enormous. And we have to recognize this isn't about the wheat crop dropping by 20 or 30 percent. This is about the disruption of where people live. So this is a story of uh, huge scale and huge risk, and that's of vital importance in understanding everything that, uh, that follows. Now, um, the, let me just illustrate the uh, scale 
here. Uh, this is the temperature graph over the last, um, over much more recent times when we've got much more direct measurement of temperature. And you can see how strongly it's been rising over the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, but of course, the kind of temperatures I'm talking about go way outside this story. This is a illustration of where we might be with different concentrations. We're already close to 450. If we try really hard, we can control that 450 to 500 and start bringing it on down from there and try to get back to 450. That would give us a roughly 50-50 chance of holding to two degrees centigrade. Crudely, 550 is, corresponds to three degrees centigrade, 650 to four, and 750 to five. It's not that precise, but it's roughly ballpark if you were to hold the concentrations at those levels. The red bar is the 5% uh, to 95% um, confidence interval. So that's illustrating the scale of what we have in mind. If we follow the already um, committed paths in uh, Copenhagen and Cancun, we're probably going to end up around 600 or thereabouts, maybe three and a half uh, maybe a 50-50 chance, a median of about three and a half degrees centigrade. Of course, we can't tell, we can't extrapolate that easily, but that looks roughly where the Copenhagen-Cancun um, targets would get us. Of course, business as usual, as I described before, way higher than uh, that. So that is an illustration of the scale and the risks. There are, um, this is what we have to do if we're to give, us a 50, give ourselves a 50-50 chance of holding to two degrees centigrade. You can see that the world emissions are gonna have to peak before 2020. That doesn't look very probable at the moment, but emissions are gonna have to peak before 2020 and come strongly on down from there. We have to be below 35, um, a billion tons per annum of CO2 equivalent 20 years from now and below 20 tons uh, 40 years from now, if we're to have a 50-50 chance of 2 degrees centigrade. The blue uh, corridor is, well, you can always do a bit more now and a bit less later or a bit less now and a bit more later because this is a flow stock uh, question. But roughly speaking, that's what the feasible paths look like. And of course, the later you leave it, the tougher you have to cut back. Um, and that uh, is illustrated through these paths. So I've given an indication of the scale of, um, the, of the impacts potentially and the kinds of probabilities we're talking about. That's why I don't much like people talking about fat tails of distributions and so on. The center of these distributions is bad enough. Um, I mean, the tails, of course, are even worse. So we should be talking about the distributions, not just the tails of the distributions. Uh, it's the whole package that looks, uh, looks so worrying. So that's the story of the scale of the risk. Now let me just say something quickly about the lags and the publicness. There's a real problem with the lags in first that it's a flow stock process. So the later you leave it, the more the flows are built up into the stocks, the more difficult it becomes. I mean, just imagine this thought experiment. Suppose we just about um, treaded water. We didn't bring down emissions very much. We didn't let them rise very much, which is roughly where we seem to be headed with current agreements. Suppose we treaded water for 20 years. Well, we're adding two and a half or more per year. We'll have added 50 or 60 in that period where we were treading water and just holding emissions constant. Remember, they're going up at the moment, but if we just held them constant, we'd have added 50 or 60 parts per million. We'd have already got close to or above 500 parts per million. And if we then got serious after that, it would be pretty difficult to hold it to 550 or so. Remember, 550 would uh, be something like a 50-50 chance of three degrees and something like a 25% chance of four degrees. I mean, four degrees catastrophic three degrees, very hard to uh, deal with. So the dangers of delay from the flow stock process are clear. But there's another danger of delay from the lock-in of, of hydrocarbons. A lot of our hydrocarbons come from our infrastructure, what kind of electricity generation we have. Um, it comes from energy efficiency, what kind of houses 
um, do we have. It comes from the kind of transport that we use. If we delay an action, we lock in those hydrocarbon emissions. And the International Energy Agency in, in Paris has uh, calculated that um, we are currently locked in about 80% of our emissions budget in energy over the next 15 years or so. If we leave it to 2017, we'd have locked it all in so that anything new would actually have to be zero carbon. And that illustrates just how much more expensive it is to delay. Because if you leave this for 10 years and then you get serious, then you're going to have to spend much more because you're going to have to scrap a lot of uh, equipment that was recently installed. So if you delay and then get serious, it's very expensive. If you delay and don't get serious, then you're into very difficult territory in terms of climate change. So those problems of lags are severe. The problem of publicness is severe because people may think, and we in economics add to this uh, uh, impression, and when we talk about free rider problems, because of this is a public good, you may be inclined to let other people do the work and relax and say, well, I'm only small part of the world, so I'll do my emitting and I'll give people lectures about cutting back on their emitting and I won't do much myself. Or I might not even give the lectures and just free ride. So the publicness is obviously something which also gives a risk of inaction and delaying action. So when I said that the, the science throws us a ball which is just about as difficult as it can get, you can see what I mean. The scale, the risks, the lags, the publicness make all aspects of policy extremely difficult. Now, um, I'm going to spend just a few moments on whether or not you're in denial. That's all it deserves, really, but uh, I suppose I have to say something. Suppose um, you wanted to argue that there was a strong case for inaction or wait and see. Now, that's an argument we have to deal with. Uh, you have to take these issues seriously. It doesn't mean that they're right. Indeed, they're wrong, in my view. But you have to deal with them. But I don't want to spend too long doing that. You would have to argue, for example, because this is about risk management, you'd have to ask, argue that you know the risks are small. That's extremely difficult and boneheaded, given the scientific evidence. It's one to say there's lots of things to say there's lots of uncertainty, but it's another thing to say actually you know the risks are small. It's very hard to see how you could say that from the science. I mean, where would it come from? Slightly more respectable argument would be, well, uncertainty means we should wait and see. But I've already illustrated just how dangerous wait and see is because the logic of the flow stop process and the lock-in. Or you can say, well, you know, we humans are pretty good, you know, we'll adapt to whatever comes our way. But I've underlined the scale of the risks here. Well, if you're in Mauritius, you can swim. That's adaptation. But if your livelihoods and where you can live have been destroyed, then that obviously is uh, extremely difficult. So what we're trying to do with mitigation is not avoid adaptation, because there's going to have to be a lot of adaptation, but try to avoid the unmanageable. Some people say that mitigation is about avoiding the unmanageable and that adaptation is about managing the unavoidable. And I think so. it's a bit cute, but it's a, uh, one way of describing it. Of course, the other thing you can do and say, well, all that stuff's in the future. I'm not bothered. Well, that actually is in some ways the most respectable of the positions because it's open and honest. And it doesn't matter what you think about the science of climate change. You're just not bothered. So, uh, well... That's something where we'd want to take on on ethical grounds, not on scientific grounds. But I think most people looking at their children and grandchildren would think that not bothering was uh, not a respectable or acceptable uh, ethical position to take. So that's what you can do. And it seems to me, and obviously the way I've expressed it, I don't find any of these arguments at all convincing. Remembering its risk and uncertainty and remembering that many of you study at the LSE and you know about type 1 errors and type 2 errors, if you accept the science as uh, giving you a strong signal to act and it turns that out that the science has overblown the risks, well, you've probably invested a bit more than you meant to, but you will uh, have new technologies, you'll have saved the forests, you'll be more energy efficient. There'll be some 
returns to your action. If, on the other hand, you reject the science and say, well, it's all um, contract, uh, if you are a presidential candidate, which you can name yourself, um, you would say, well, you know, it's all, all a con, we're not doing anything. Then, of course, if the science turns out to be right, and of course it's highly probable it is right, but if the science turns out to be right, then you're in a position, for the reasons I described, from which it's extremely difficult to extricate yourself. Okay, well, you can dignify this argument with the name of decision theory, or you can refer to it as common sense, but if you just look at it, as you must, as a problem of risk and uncertainty and different kinds of errors, then surely you see that uh, this type of argument of uh, waiting and seeing is unsustainable relative to this assessment of the errors. So that's the arguments. Now, what are the techniques? Because this isn't a stuff that's uh, been put as a, in a way where you have really respectable arguments. But they're techniques that are used in all this. I don't want to obsess about it. But you confuse the risk uncertainty side with not knowing anything at all. We don't know anything here with certainty, but we can say something about the probability distributions and where they are. Um, but people suggest that uh, if it's risk and uncertainty, then you might as well assume that you don't know anything. And you might refer to Churchill, Churchill and uh, Deng Xiaoping as smoking and drinking very heavily and living till around 90 and suggest that these don't damage your health. Well, we're talking about probabilities, right? We're talking about probability distributions. And it's not true that because you're talking about probability distributions, you don't know anything. Or you can find a few papers with mistakes. If you look at uh, the American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, the Econometrica, our beloved outputs, uh, sort of destinations for our outputs in economics, there'll be a few papers that will be wrong. Um, but there'll be thousands of papers that are not wrong. If you find two or three papers that are wrong, or even 10 or 15 papers in several thousand that are wrong, you then imply that you can disregard all the rest. Well, that's obviously intellectually dishonest. And it, actually, the press in the UK never asked, when we were talking about University of East Anglia email, they never asked, well, what if you struck out the whole of the output of the University of East Anglia ever on all subjects? What difference would it make to the science of climate change? Yeah? Nothing. because. You know, the results that were being discussed were produced in NOAA and NASA and various other places. They didn't need them. But you have to ask, if you find a mistake, what difference does it make? That's what rational inquiries about. Of course, that didn't happen. When bad arguments are refuted, they uh, are ignored. Those of you who like conspiracies can read uh, um, Naomi Oreskes and Conway Merchants of Doubt on on the techniques that are used. But basically, if you want to know about science, you should consult the scientific um, academies, because they, you're not taking the word of the climate scientists, because the sci but the scientific academies look at other people's science. Actually, they look at the science of people who might be diverting research grants from their area. So, Ask the National Academy of Sciences what they have done and whether they've done a reasonable job in assessing um, biogenetics, um, nuclear physics, climate change, and see what they say and form your, try to look at it and form your own judgment. But um, be very careful about um, people who peddle snake oil. They have every, have, they have every right to peddle snake oil, but they have also a duty to have their oil scrutinized and identified as what sort of oil it really is. So we must have these arguments, we must have the challenge, that's what universities and science is all about. But there's no right to have a bad argument classified as a good argument, or a bad argument classified as on level pegging with a good argument. The arguments need to be scrutinized, and when they do, in terms of the denials here, they just fall apart. Now, that's all I'm going to say about this in the, next, uh, in the next lectures, but I suppose one has to cover that. Now, let me say something about the, uh, the ethics, because this story of the science um, impinges very directly on the way we look at the ethics. We're talking about huge effects, potential major loss of life if we do nothing. So how do we think about 
the ethics. Well, I'm not going to uh, have time to go into this in great detail, but there's a, a, a quote here by another of uh, LSE's uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, Amartya Sen, um, where he is underlying our obligation as social scientists to bring our values to the fore. We can't just read off our values from the market or the trade-offs that the market gives us are the trade-offs we should use in ethic making ethical judgments. That's the point that the March is making, I think, quite elegantly here, but it's an absolutely vital point, and one, of course, which Lionel Robbins himself would have agreed with uh, very strongly. If you're making ethical judgments, bring them out and discuss them, and that's what we surely have to do. Now, there are many sorts of ethics which are relevant here. Um, we can talk about rights, the rights of future generations, um, the rights, as it were, not to have their environment destroyed by the actions of others. That's, if you like, uh, the liberties of the kind that um, Isaiah Berlin used to talk about. Do you have a right to have your environment protected in some way from the molestation of other people in particular? Uh, do you have a right as an earlier generation to disrupt and destroy the physical environment of later generations and thus reduce their chances in life. That's about liberty and justice, and those seem to me to be very important parts of the story. You can ask the Aristotelian question about how does a virtuous person behave. But we, in economics, generally talk um, in a very direct way about consequentialism, and indeed we um, narrow that still further to welfareism and often utilitarianism. Um, but basically, we stick to consequentialism in economics. I really don't have time to, as it were, to give a whole story about moral philosophy and ethics, but I think you can see from the way I've expressed it that these different ways of looking at the problem, some of which economists take on board, some of which they don't, actually generally point in the same way for strong and early action. And if a number of philosophical positions do point the same way, then I think that uh, we can be encouraged, as it were, that we're gathering and assembling the arguments, normative arguments, of course, but we're assembling them in a uh, convincing way. There are two particular areas where when we get down to the nitty gritty, um, economists and others have argued about. The first one is the intra-generational issues, and in particular, the distributional issues across countries. Given that rich countries are responsible for the majority of the concentrations in the atmosphere and the poor countries are hit earliest and hardest, what are the duties and responsibilities of the rich countries? What are the rights to this small remaining carbon space? Who should have the right to what? Now, there are some who argue that this is a commons, there's only a certain amount available each year, and that we as human beings should have equal right to this commons. Now, that sounds all right, but it's not a position that I find terribly convincing. Because it doesn't look carefully enough at the science, which talks about stocks rather than flows. It doesn't look carefully enough at the economics, because when we create rights to carbon space, we're creating financial assets. And those financial assets are of a, of a kind which is similar to other financial assets. So if we were actually giving out dollars, would we give one dollar to everybody, regardless of uh, their income level? That's actually not the way we normally answer the question uh, when we're talking about political economy. We would normally argue you should give, at least I hope so, that the, you, you should start with looking after poor people first. Now, you can make that formulaic in different ways. So I don't think that the idea of equal access to the flow space makes sense, either the point, point of view of science or the point of view of the economics. And of course, it leaves out all the ethical issues of historical responsibility. Now, actually, when you bring in these arguments, they all point the same way, that uh, equal flow rights to the carbon space is actually not egalitarian enough. But I don't think that this story is a very good way of looking at things, certainly not politically, because it's not going to get very far. I think a much better way to look at it is the way I started, 
we've got a challenge of overcoming world poverty and managing climate change. How do we put in place economic st structures and financial transfers which uh, work as well as we possibly can in terms of managing climate change and tackling some of the distributional issues? And I prefer to see it that way rather than narrowing the argument right down and haggling over carbon space. Trouble is that uh, all the foreign offices around the world are told that the world is a zero-sum game and it's their job to go and do arm wrestling. Whichever foreign office you interact with, I mean, I'm not being entirely fair, but uh, you, you do see everything, everything about burden sharing and wrestling. And of course, if you do that, you get locked into probably <coughs> arguments which you probably can't really resolve about access to carbon space. I much prefer to put it in a positive way. How do we overcome poverty and manage climate change at the same time? How do we think of development trajectories which can do this? How do we think of the kind of support that we ought to be giving each other? And I think that's a much better way of looking at it. I'll say a very quick word about discounting because there's a lot of time wasted uh, after the Stern Review on the issues of discounting. Usually, the, the argument was really pretty awful, actually, in terms of its recognition of modern public um, economics. Some people focused on pure time discounting, and that's simply discrimination by date of birth. So in other words, lives that come later, regardless of the income level, lives that come later have less value. That's pure time discounting. I don't think that has any foundation in moral philosophy uh, whatsoever. People occasionally say, well, I know people who behave that way. Yeah, well, you may know people who behave that way. The question is, is that a decent ethical stance when you come and think about where we should be coming from? Or they'll say, David Hume said something like this. Or David Hume actually recognized the deficiencies of that particular argument. Or you say, well, I've just built a model that doesn't make sense without pure time discounting, because some integral doesn't converge. Well, you probably have built a silly model if that's the uh, story. So I think if you look at the arguments about pure time discounting, they just don't add up. What about people who want to pull the discount rates um, out of markets? Well, that's just wrong on so many different levels in this context. First, discount rates from the markets, the rates of return and the rates of interest that people see, are way <clears throat> short of the kind of time horizons that uh, we're looking about looking at, and in particular, they don't take account of the fundamental question that over the time horizons we're looking at, perhaps 100 years or so, people might be much poorer, much poorer than they are as a result, than they are now, as a result of unmanaged climate change. That would give you negative discounting if you related discounting to income levels. It doesn't take any account of there being many goods. Consumption may go up for a while, but the environmental services are going down. So, you have to link your discount rates to your goods. I'm getting slightly technical for those of you who like your economics, but if one good's going up, another good's going down, you can have dis different discount rates for those uh, goods, and you've got to make up your mind what you're talking about. So much of the argument about reading off for the markets was wrong because incomes can go down. It was wrong because it didn't take into account that fundamentally there were many goods here. It was wrong because it didn't take into account all the imperfections that we see in capital markets. It was wrong because there aren't these long-term capital markets for collective decisions out there, which is the ethical thing that we're uh, talking about. And if you do, nevertheless, insist on going down this route of reading it off from the market, the long-run riskless rate of return, if there are any riskless rates of return left, but the long-run risk rate, riskless rate of return looks like, if you look at UK or US markets, looks like one or one and a half percent. And it's the riskless rate of return that counts because you're taking into account of uncertainty in other ways in your modeling. So of, overall, it would, the argument about the discount rate was of uh, really um, depressing standard and actually diverted attention from the big risk management issues at stake here, which I don't think the narrow one good modeling much beloved of economists, including myself, um, really can capture. This is about lives and livelihoods and possible death through migration and conflict of people over 100 years or so. You can't really get at that very satisfactory in a one good model. It's nice to try and it can throw a bit of light and okay.
but it doesn't actually really, in my view, give you as much as you need on this whole story of um, how you formulate policy which is equitable and effective in terms of uh, its um, management of risk. That's all I'll say um, about the ethics. There is in slide 30, you must be one formula actually, a professor of economics at the LSE has got to have one formula. Here's a formula. Um, it's, a, it's nearly a formula. Where's my formula? Um, Oh, here's my formula. Yeah, those who like optimum growth theory can take the elasticity of the social margin to the income eta times the growth rate g and add on to it the pure time discount rate. It's sort of obvious because growth g is about incomes going up, eta is how much you um, adjust the growth rate to take into account your views about income distribution, given that uh, incomes are going up, and delta is the pure time discount rate. It's not easy, not difficult to derive that. Trouble is that G may not be positive. Indeed, it won't be if we mismanage climate change. I've already said that delta, and given the arguments why delta should be low, and we don't really know what eta is. Um, some of my good friends do know what eta is. And my great friend Richard Layard knows that eta is equal to one. Um, I've got other friends who tell me very confidently that uh, Marty Weitzman and, and Partha Dasgupta tell me they know that eta is bigger than two. And I've got my great friend Tony Atkinson, who's looked at this very carefully in terms of what uh, you can infer from decisions that people take, and he tells me that eaters all over the place. And uh, that was a conclusion I came in a paper I wrote in 1977 um, and still stick by. So I do think that this whole discussion of discounting has not been very good, but it's been diversionary. That's the worry. It's been diversionary from the big issues of risk uh, management. Now, I've taken 50 minutes so far, Judith. Can I have another five or 10? I just put that to note Okay, you. all right, thanks, Max. boss. I'll, I'll uh, compress it, I think I can do that. Um, now, um, I've already argued, and if you think back to that slide which had um, emissions peaking before 2020 and coming on down, I've already given the argument about where we need to go for two degrees, a uh, 50-50 chance of two degrees. Now, I'm going to argue, and this is really the topic of lecture two, that we know a great deal about how to bring these um, emissions down. Um, I've already argued that to go to 550 uh, parts per million concentration eventually, would bring with it something like a 25% risk of going above four degrees and would be centered around three degrees. Most of us, I think, if we were to contemplate the consequences, would have a view that if we can possibly avoid that, it makes sense. So if we can demonstrate that at reasonable cost, and we can have to describe and analyze what that means, we can hold to 450, we should. That even going to 550, and that would be some work to hold to 550 would be very dangerous for the reasons I've described. So if we can hold to 450, we should. Some people would say, well, we've got to do much better than that. Indeed, they make it explicit. The small island states say we must center around 1.5 degrees centigrade, not two. Then you'd have to start to bring down to 400 or 425 or probably 400. But what I want to argue is that the kinds of paths that you're going to follow, whether it's 425, 450, 475, or 500 as your target, would over the next 10 years or so look quite similar. So in other words, you're going to have to cut, make great strides in energy efficiency and renewables and in stopping deforestation over these next 10 or 15 years. So if you're not quite sure what your target should be, but you're pretty confident for the reasons I described that it should be a lot less than 550 parts per million in terms of concentrations. If you accept that argument, then you're going to set off down a fairly similar road. And we're going to learn like mad along the way. So let's suppose that we'll set off down a 450 road or 50-50 chance of two degrees centigrade. If we learn enough down that road in the next 10 or 15 years, then maybe we can tighten our, um, tighten our objectives. We might end up thinking we're going to have to weaken them, but if we do, we're going to have to acknowledge that we get into extremely difficult territory. 
So I think that approach to risk management, which says we are where we are, what's the best we can do in terms of holding on to these probabilities? Can we describe how to do it in a way that actually indicates that it's quite attractive in terms of learning processes, in terms of energy security, energy efficiency, biodiversity, and so on? If we can do that, then we've made a powerful case for the route that we should go down. I think that's the right way to look at the risk management problem. I don't think to try to build a stochastic optimum growth model to try to find out exactly what the right path of emissions reductions would be makes any sense. It doesn't make any sense because it's so difficult to put precise values on the costs of unmanaged climate change. This is about hundreds of millions of pe people's lives being at risk. And we're not very good, and for understandable reasons, at putting values on that, which we can feed into a um, stochastic dynamic programming or optimum growth model. It doesn't matter if you know what those words really mean, but you can see what I'm talking about in terms of you know, precise attempts to optimize a path when it's extremely difficult to identify, particularly the costs of unmanaged climate change. So I think the kind of risk management approach which I've described in a rather intuitive way um, makes sense, particularly since the first 10 or 15 years of most of the paths that we would point to from that um, description look fairly, um, fairly similar. So you now get to the, uh, some of the key words in the title of the lecture series. If we're to cut absolute emissions from close to 50 billion tonnes a year now down to less than 20 billion tonnes 40 years from now and less than 35 billion tonnes 20 years from now and allow the kind of growth that's probably necessary to overcome poverty, if you are to see the world economy, if it's decently managed, particularly from the point of view of climate change, growing at 2.5% or so a year, you're going to see a world economy that's multiplied by a factor of three in the next, in the next 40 years. So if you take the two and a half factor for the absolute cut in emissions that's necessary for a 50-50 chance of two degrees, and you take a factor of three for the growth of output, then you're going to have to cut emissions per unit of output by a factor of three times two and a half. Well, that's exactly seven and a half, but somewhere order of magnitude seven or eight. There'll be some areas where it's not so easy to cut emissions per unit of output by a factor of eight. Agriculture, you can cut quite a lot actually, but a factor of eight would probably be quite tough. So that you won't be able to cut emissions per unit of output to zero everywhere. Um, but it seems clear that you're going to have to cut it close to zero in a number of places because you've got to divide by a factor of eight. In some places it won't be so easy to divide by a factor of eight. That's why I call it an industrial revolution. It's such a radical change in the relationship between emissions and output. And it has to be everywhere. You can't leave a sector out if you're trying to make a change of that magnitude. It's not, sim it's not simply a matter of getting your electrons down the electricity wires from a different source. That itself, I don't think, could be described as industrial revolution. It would be, if you like, technological change of some importance. But this is about agriculture. It's about forestry. It's about manufacturing. It's very importantly about buildings and industrial processes. And a significant bit of it is about electricity. Transport, of course, clearly of great importance. You're going to have to change everywhere. About half of what we need to do in the energy sector, we can do, or well, it looks as if we can do, if we're smart, through energy efficiency. Particularly if we combine, as it were, the ICT, the information and communications technology revolution with the um, uh, energy and emissions revolution. But the, it's, the reason I call it an industrial revolution is the sheer scale of change and the importance of acting right across the economy as a whole. I say it's not just switching from coal to nuclear for your electricity. It's a much deeper uh, set of changes than that. So this is a, why I think the magnitudes of it all give us a story of the industrial revolution.
Now let me sp spend my last few minutes on why it's so important, why it's so difficult to communicate about this subject. I'm going to come back to that in lecture three and where we're going, which I'll demonstrate in just one slide. Sorts of peculiar ways about risk, particularly actually big, big risks. They find it more difficult to think about big risks than uh, small risks. The, um, the scientists are reluctant to describe this with, I think, the energy and focus that they should. Why? They're not dumb, they're very clever. But they will tell you that actually you're asking me to describe things so far outside the range of our experience that I feel reluctant to making, about making strong statements. That's respectable academically. But uh, if they can't help us try to describe these risks, then who can? So I spend a fair bit of time encouraging my scientific friends to just be a bit more explicit about these probability distributions. You can't do it by experience. At the end of the Second World War, when the Bretton Woods institutions were being established, when Lionel Robbins was working in the uh, UK government, it was two world wars and the Great Depression. The blood was on the carpet. You could see that the inability to collaborate was deeply destructive. By the time we see these things on the scale we've described, it's uh, actually too late to do anything about it. So let me close by saying, well, given how difficult I've made it all seem, I'm actually going to try to make it seem a bit easier tomorrow, but given how difficult I've made it all seem, how tough is all this? Where, where are we going? What do the current... Um, what do the current commitments look like? Well, essentially, the best interpretation of current commitments is the line that goes uh, as a more or less horizontal from where we are now. If everybody did what they said they'd do in the strongest possible interpretation of what they said they would do at Copenhagen, Cancun, and Durban, I was at all those things, and I'll tell you some of those stories in lecture three. But um, if they all did the strongest version of what they said they'd do, we would roughly plateau at around 50 billion tonnes of emissions per annum. That's where we're headed. Not on business as usual. Business as usual is way higher up than that, but on the basis of the statements that have been made so far. Now, that looks very dangerous. Um, this uh, dotted and dashed line is the line where we need to be over the next 20 years to have much of a chance of holding to two degrees, or a 50-50 chance of holding to two degrees. So I've given optimistic suggestions about the new industrial revolution. I've raised question marks about where, whether we'll get there or not, and I'm raising strong question marks about where we're headed at the uh, moment. It looks worrying. I mean, it looks as if the rich countries will knock off about 5 billion tonnes and the developing countries will add on about 5 billion tonnes in the next two decades. That would leave, of course, the rich countries much higher emissions than the poor countries, but it would still leave us with that plateau, which is much bigger than we uh, can tolerate. I'll come back to geoengineering. Are we going into territory where we're going to have to start fiddling around in all sorts of dramatic ways? I hope not, because those dramatic ways of either stopping the energy getting in or, um, uh, or absorbing the CO2 in some way through you know, putting muck in the oceans. Either you put muck in the atmosphere or muck in the oceans if you're sort of broader. It's not exactly what geoengineering is, but it's that sort of that sort of thing with all kinds of consequences we don't really understand. I mean, should we be thinking about that? Well, we probably should at least be researching on it, but it would be very worrying to go there, and I may have time to come back to that later on. But I do want to say, and uh, this is, that's just telling you there are lots of references in the slides which you can download in about 25 minutes, but the, uh, the story of where people are going is not that discouraging. There are countries around the world which are taking this enormously seriously. Ethiopia is looking to be a, a middle-income country 15 years from now and uh, close to zero carbon. China's 12th five-year plan, which started in March, was a radical change from what went before. Trouble is that China's growth rates are such that China 
is still moving uh, strongly upwards. But the discussions are changing. And interestingly, in the rich world, which has gone a bit flaky on climate change, particularly in the US, uh, if you just look at what's going on in the rich world, you'd get more depressed than if you looked more broadly at what's going on in emerging and developing markets. That'll be the main subject of what I have to say in Lecture 3. In Lecture 2, I'll be talking, that's uh, tomorrow, much more about policy. So let me stop there. There's a little bit of time for questions. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Well, um, I think as always, Nick's tried to pack a whole book in, uh, into one uh, hour. Obviously, he's covered an enormous range. Uh, there is about 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Are you going to stay there, Nick, or are no. you going to come and sit here? Okay. So, we will take questions uh, from the floor if you will uh, say who you are. And if you would confine it to questions and not sort of mini lectures of your own, that would be hugely appreciated. Okay. Questions. There's a gentleman at the back there and a lady at the back there. A quick one. Would there be a benefit in a new, another stern review? <laughs> and the lady? Oh, uh, my name's Jessica Shankham and I'm a journalist from Business Green. Um, you mentioned that you would like climate scientists to be more vocal about their feelings about climate change. I wondered what you thought of the climate scientists who felt so strongly that he uh, managed to get hold of the documents from the Heartland Institute uh, revealing who was funding them. Okay, I'll take one more. No? Well, we take the... No. Okay, maybe up there. Uh, thank you, my name's Vicky Wakefield. I'm a student at Sussex University. Um, so my question is, to what extent are we, by framing this as an issue of countries against countries, are we missing the point of income distribution within countries? Um, and can we move towards it being an issue of people rather than countries? And is the UN process harming things because we're setting it as country against country? Okay, um, Nick. I'm not, I'm not sure. That, does this mic work? Can you hear me at the back yeah. there? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about another um, stern review. I, mean, I, I believe in study and inquiry and research. How often do you sort of try to bring a, a big package together and try to understand it all at one go. I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. Um, probably the strongest is maybe. Um, I did the report for the Commission for Africa in the year before the Stern Review, and then I did the Stern Review, and I did them back to back. So it's going to have to be the blogs, blogs review. I don't think it's the Stern Review, if there is a, another one. The, the Heartland Institute. Uh, I don't think that's a very important question, quite honestly. I think that scientists should, uh, like social scientists, get on and do uh, decent, uh, solid, serious research and try to do it on issues that count and share their ideas in a productive way. That's what really matters. And I think the, the tawdry stories of who hacked into whom, when, and just how dodgy it looked when they'd hacked in. I think they're diversions from serious discussion. I think we have to ask ourselves, what are the big policy issues? And I hope that uh, you as a reporter will focus in what you do on these subjects about what are the big policy issues, and not simply who looks through whose window uh, in the night. Uh, I just don't think that's a very good way of proceeding. Um, on countries and countries and income distribution within countries, I do agree with that. There's some nice work by Robert Sokolow and his uh, collaborators actually looking at, that, looking at those kinds of issues. And uh, I think in terms of this story, we are more or less citizens of the world. And uh, just to narrow these stories in terms of country versus country distribution, uh, I think doesn't do justice to it. So I'd broadly agree with uh, your thoughts on that. The, the, our journalist friend at the back wants we, you put two hands up for the right to reply. We'll give you a right to reply. 
It's just a very, to big, very I just magnanimous to, no, I just wanted to say that I was deliberating between two questions, so I'll ask you the policy question. Um, no, if you, well, that, well, right. Thank you very much. I don't want you to think I'm a bad journalist. No. Um, if uh, You mentioned that um, the path over the first 10 to 15 years would be the same for um, countries um, regard, um, you know, depending on how how much commitment they made to cutting carbon emissions. So how important do you think it is for the EU to commit sooner rather than later to a 30 degree, 30% uh, target rather than the current 20%? Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I think that um, I would be in favor of moving up to 30% because the EU is a place where uh, I think there's great potential for discovery and the power of the example. Uh, for my sins, I'm on the board of the um, European Institute of Technology. And I think raising the ambitions would put great energy uh, behind the whole process of discovery. It would make the investment process um, more um, confident. That people would be assuming that if those targets were raised, that the policies would be strengthened along with them. So I think you would actually uh, influence the rate of change and the rate of discovery. And I do think that that would be uh, important. So when I was saying that a 450 path and a 475 path might look quite similar in the early stages, for both of them, you'd really have to move much faster. And this was the point I was making at the end. For both of them, you'd have to move much faster than we are now. So I think accelerating that process of investment, innovation, discovery is very important and could come from the EU raising its targets, and I hope it will. Okay, one, two, three, okay. That's the next lot. Anne Power from Case in the LSE. Um, from what you're saying, you're a little bit skeptical about scientific intervention to, to tamper with the climate because because of the risk that would carry against the risk of rapid climate change. But you're laying a lot of hope in technological in innovation. And I'm just a bit worried that the balance of technological innovation can't possibly be spread fast enough <coughs> to counter the problems that you've described with such urgency. So where would you put energy saving and how big a potential do you think there is there? There's one there. With Hi, I think um, there was a gentleman as well, but uh, okay. <laughs> Valerie Flynn from European Daily Carbon Markets. I'm a journalist as well. Um, so prices in the European emissions trading system are uh, depressed at the moment because of oversupply. And I was wondering, do you have a perspective on whether or not um, political intervention in this emissions trading system to boost prices is a good idea? It's a major policy debate at the moment in the EU. Okay, now that there was a student, wasn't there? Or a staff member <laughs> down here. Okay. <laughs> Can Hi. I, you know, journalists are always welcome, but can I give a chance for the students and staff members? Okay. Sorry, I may be disappointing you here. Uh, uh, my name is Sam Roots, I'm from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, there's been a lot of discussion we, about we public... charge for entry, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, There's been some discussion about public policy this evening, but given the degree to which US politics dances to the tune of vested commercial interests, and there may be good reasons for that, which are beneficial. To what extent can the lead start to come from the private sector? Um, uh, and question, uh, I think actually the process of discovery for different ways of doing things uh, is much easier to understand and much less risky than uh, geoengineering, which is playing around with the whole atmosphere and our oceans in ways we really don't understand and which probably involve enormous uh, risks. I mean, if we just stop the energy coming in and try to cool off in that way, we'd still have atmospheres full of uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases and they'd still be poisoning the oceans. So we really don't understand what the effects of geoengineering would look like. And We've only got one Earth to experiment with. But we can look at different kinds of technologies and explore, and some of them will work well, some of them won't work well. I mean, industrial revolutions, 
uh, have their failures. They wouldn't be revolutions uh, without them, but they're not so damaging as failing on geoengineering. Um, energy saving, as I mentioned uh, very quickly, if you look at the energy sector, what we have to do, uh, energy savings probably about half of it. It is the most important single thing. Um, engineer, energy saving, of course, um, it, part of it's easy and just sort of turning down or controlling the thermostat better, but a lot of it is creative and a lot of it is associated with new materials, a lot of it's associated with insulation investments, as you know very well, and you're on a great researcher and uh, public policy person in, in that area. Um, but about half of what we have to do in, uh, in this whole story in the energy sector is energy saving. There is no silver bullet, but that's the closest to it, but it's only half of one. The prices are depressed in the EU. Well, it's not surprising if you uh, send the EU into depression, but you hand out uh, quotas in hand out quotas uh, as if there weren't a depression, then the price of, the, uh, of um, carbon emissions is going to go down. I think it's a good idea, as a number of colleagues have argued, a good idea to have a floor under uh, emissions prices. And you can do that, of course, by tightening uh, when the economy slackens, tighten, <coughs> tighten the amount of quotas. So I do think that we need direct policy to keep up the price. Uh, because it's confidence in what those policies will be that drive investment. And we've seen through feed-in tariffs that that can have actually a very powerful effect if you give that confidence on what the prices will be. Now, feed-in tariffs, those are the prices at which you sell the electricity, but similarly, if you had confidence and a, and a good level of the price of, on the price of carbon, that would, for example, make it much more likely that if gas is a bridging technology, gas substitutes for coal rather than for renewables. So I think that's a very important... Um, uh, part of um, policy making. Sorry, the Bloomberg, the last question, I just forgot it. Could you repeat it very quickly? Um, how can the private sector start? Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's enormously important, probably of the kinds of 2 or 3% of GDP increase investment we're going to need. Um, and you, you're guessing at what comes from what sector, but probably over 80% of that will be private sector. So it's absolutely fundamental. And actually, a lot of the private sector looks much further forward than governments. I mean, a lot of the investments you make in infrastructure have 20, 30, 40-year time horizons. I'd have to tell you, you're from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So you have to take that kind of view. And you wouldn't be very smart to build um, a coal-fired power station in Europe or the US without carbon capture and storage, because you'd know you're likely to get into real difficulty uh, not very long from now, if you do. So you can see already firms taking long-run views. You can see firms already focusing much more strongly on uh, energy efficiency. And you can see the development of new technologies. And I'll come back to that tomorrow at a pretty rapid uh, rate, using some, actually, Bloomberg uh, figures. Um, but things are changing, and I do think the private sector will have a very powerful role to play. Well, it's obvious in terms of where the investment's likely to come from. But it doesn't happen by itself. So this is an industrial revolution that needs strong policy. It's actually rather different from industrial revolutions on the past, which actually could work as long as the government kept out of the way. In this case, you need the government to help markets work well. You need governments to correct market failure so the private sector can play the role which it will play as an dr entrepreneurial driver of this whole story in the manner of um, the great uh, LSE professor Friedrich von Hayek and Joseph Schumpeter and, and so on. Okay, well this will be the last round, so I'm going to make it a journalist free round. Um, there was a gentleman up there who I assume is not a journalist, okay, to start with. Then there was somebody down on the back row here Blue shirt. You can be a gentleman and okay. a journalist. Okay, and okay, a uh, gentleman. I wasn't implying that you couldn't be, all right? <laughs> Would I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, your question, please. Hi, good evening. Um, basically, my question is: We've seen there is there is exists a strong link between uh, emission, the CO two emissions, and uh, hi, <laughs> and uh, and the economic growth. Basically, we're, we're relying right now in some kind of uh, technological solutions for trying to 
decrease our, our emissions. But we're also um, assuming that the economic growth will, will persist. The present, the current economic, uh, economic model in, in general will accept some kind of change in order to decrease the way it's, it's growing and, and will deliver some kind of a reduction in the, in the total emissions. I mean, in other words, could we ch accept this kind of challenge that in, in the economic growth? Could we link both uh, GHG emissions and economic growth? Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's very in line with my question, actually. So, um, say who you are. So, are. my name's Guy Rickard. I'm from the Carbon Trust. Um, uh, just really wondered if you could explain uh, more the, the impact that, um, well, the potential changes that we need to make in the developing world to reduce consumption as well as uh, relying on technological um, solutions. And then what does that mean for economic growth in the developing world? Okay, and the last one. Tim Root from Muswell Hill, coordinator of Muswell Hill Friends of the Earth. You've said that people find it hard to consider large risks, and the people in the rich countries who are most likely to confront these large risks are the younger ones among us. What kind of interventions in the political sphere do you think could um, help civil society to take political action, taking these large risks into account. Okay, thank you very much. Nick. Uh, the first two questions are really about uh, growth of consumption and emissions. Basically, we have to break the relationship between consumption and production on the one hand and emissions on the other. Suppose we stop growing completely now, stopped all consumption and production growth now. We're emitting about uh, 50 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent a year. That is two and a half times what it's going to need to be 40 years from now. Just stopping growth doesn't deliver unless we break the relationship between the way we consume and produce and the way we live and emissions, and other issues too. I didn't dwell on it in the paper, but the sustainability environment is much more than climate change, although most of the issues are totally bound up. Other issues are totally bound up with climate change. But unless we break that relationship, we're just not going to be able to manage to um, uh, avoid the very big risks of climate change. So I prefer to see it in terms of the challenge of breaking that relationship between consumption and production on the one hand and emissions on the other. Because unless we do, we're in deep trouble. Secondly, uh, it's very difficult to imagine, indeed I think it's immoral, to tell um, the people of the developing world, well, we've just done our sums and sorry, we filled it all up, no room for you to raise your material standards of living. That's a very difficult case to put, either morally or politically. And I think that puts further emphasis on the importance of breaking that relationship between production and consumption on the one hand and uh, emissions on the other. And there are various ways and all kinds of dimensions of change that we can think about. I mean, if the people of California do more yoga and buy less Maseratis, that is, uh, and they have a very expensive yoga teacher, that is not necessarily reducing consumption, but it's certainly reducing <coughs> emissions. And uh, so I think we're going to have to think about changing patterns of consumption, changing patterns of production, um, uh, always underlining the point that energy efficiency in the energy area is a half of what we need to do, but it's not all of what we need to do. Now the last question um, is deeply important, is how we generate the, uh, how we can think about the way in which the political will to make change comes about. I'm going to try to say a bit more about that in the, uh, in the last lecture, but the great John Stuart Mill, I think, helped us a lot on that one when he was describing the way in which people change uh, 
the way in which they look at things through um, public discussion. Amartya Sen talks a lot about public reasoning. And he gives the example of um, Ashoka and Emperor Ashoka in India getting different kinds of perspectives together to discuss. And I think that process of public discussion and public reasoning is one where people sim go beyond simply looking at the logical consequences of different forms of action. Us policy wonks you know, try to think, well, if I pull this, then something elsewhere in the system will change, and we look at policy that way. But when we discuss policy, and we discuss what the right thing to do, when we do that, we actually start to develop our views about values as well as about consequences. So I think public discussion of these issues is ab absolutely fundamental. I think the geography teachers of the world are probably doing, I'm sitting next to a wonderful geographer, but the geography teachers in the schools, I think, have a big role, and the science teachers a big role to play in helping people look at the basic logic of the issues, but at the same time, discuss what values we ought to bring to bear. Because I think we learn about those things through public discussion, through interaction, through places like the LSE, where Sydney and Beatrice Webb saw this place as one of the places where you have that kind of discussion. But it has to be, I think, very broad across the globe. It's interesting how many people in developing countries are aware of these kinds of issues and think a lot about them and do think about responsibility and values. Um, but I don't see any other way, really, to, uh, to moving forward on that, because it has to be a public, uh, a public decision. So it has to come about through public understanding and public reasoning. And the young people have to be very much involved in that. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. There are no more questions. But, of course, there are two more lectures. And quite a lot of the issues that you are raising, I think Nick will actually address in the next two lectures. Uh, I'm sure you will want to thank Nick in the usual way, and I want to thank all of you, and to invite you all for a small uh, reception, which is just out in the atrium. <laughs>